All right, let's uh, go ahead and get started. I'll pray for us. Father, I pray that as we look at your word today that you would open our minds to the scriptures. I pray that you would help us understand what you have intended uh, when you inspired your perfect word for us. I pray that the result of today, uh, that you'll work love in our hearts for you and for other people, that you would work humility in us as your people. And I pray that at the end of the day that Christ would be exalted, for it's in his name that we pray. Amen. So I love this picture uh, from a website called fulloveyes.com. Um, much of what we do in this class is a redemptive historical approach to the Old Testament. And the website fulloveyes.com takes a redemptive historical approach and adds to it uh, an artistic sensibility um, and I found it fascinating and helpful uh, to understand many of the uh, stories in the Bible and then I love this quote from Augustine in the confessions early in the confessions uh, he writes who will grant to me to rest in you who will grant to me so that you come into my heart and intoxicate it so that I forget my evils and embrace you, my only uh, good. If you've never read any Augustine, um, many people would put him as the greatest thinker in the first thousand years of uh, Christianity, excluding uh, Jesus and the apostles. Uh, so wonderful. Um, writer and I commend him to you. So what we're going to talk about today is circumcision and biblical theology. And circumcision actually plays a huge role in both the Old Testament and the New. And it's a difficult thing to understand. It's a difficult thing to come to the text and to say what in the world uh, is this about? Why, why is it in Scripture? And so that's what we're going uh, to do today. As always, make sure you take attendance quiz uh, 13. Uh, if you ever miss one of those quizzes, I'm more than happy to help uh, set that right. But uh, please take it if you can uh, today. So we're going to look at circumcision and biblical theology and I imagine when you've read about circumcision in the Old Testament and the New, I imagine that you have a million questions. Um, the first is why such a painful and bloody rite um, of all the signs that God could have picked out, uh, why in the world would he uh, implement uh, such a painful and bloody ride and for a man, an, an adult man, um, that's probably going to be the most pain uh, a person would ever feel, a man would ever feel, and why, uh, why would God do that? Uh, and why does Yahweh almost kill Moses uh, for not circumcising his two sons? Uh, if you've read the story, I hope you did as part of the homework uh, questions. Um, Moses is in the process of obeying God. Uh, he's finally agreed with God's commission and he's on his way uh, to Egypt. And Yahweh shows up and almost, uh, almost kills Moses for not having circumcised his two sons. So uh, that's very odd that Moses is actually obeying God and the fact that he had not uh, circumcised his son meant that he almost lost his life. And as we read that story, it may imply 
that um, th that led to a, a divorce between uh, Moses and his uh, wife, perhaps a temporary divorce, but uh, certainly a, a separation between the two of them over the issue of uh, circumcision. And we might ask the question, why uh, for infant um, circumcision is it specified that it must happen on the eighth day? Why, why did God think the eighth day was important? And if you're talking about an adult uh, man, uh, I've tried to find some uh, information about this on the internet and evidently the recovery process for an adult man is very long um, 30 days uh, 45 days uh, recovery time and why when God chose a sign did he pick a sign that would be by nature exclusively male uh, that seems very odd uh, when he's uh, creating this initiating rite that uh, welcomes people into the people of God. Why did he pick a sign that by necessity would exclude women? And why is it so odd? Would you grant that these are some of the questions that you would uh, have when you uh, come to this story uh, and uh, so that's what we're going to look at uh, today. Uh, just by way of uh, show of hands, anyone ever heard a sermon on circumcision uh, before? Uh, oh, well, uh, uh, it's not something that uh, would be the easiest subject, uh, but that's what we're going to look at uh, today. And the main thing that I'm trying to persuade you of in this entire class is that Jesus answers the, quest the hard questions of the Bible. Um, that if you take a Christocentric view of Scripture, that all Scripture is somehow connected uh, with Jesus, you'll begin to walk in the direction where many of these things will find resolution. I love this uh, quote from the church historian Philip Schaff who says Christ Jesus is the beginning middle and end of it all in Christ Jesus all contradictions are reconciled uh, I might add to that that in Christ Jesus even the difficult passages will become clear so how do we understand this thing uh, about circumcision well, when you come to the Bible, realize that there is a divide between the Garden of Eden, where there was no sin, and what happens after the Garden of Eden when people are kicked out. And when we talked about the giving of the law, uh, we highlighted that uh, this was given at Mount Sinai and this looks like a mount of death. Uh, it's out in the middle of uh, nowhere. Uh, nothing can live there, virtually nothing. Uh, it is so unlike the Garden of Eden. Well, uh, make the same point about circumcision. Was circumcision in force in the Garden of Eden? And the answer is no. Um, in fact, uh, the word Eden means pleasure. In one place in the uh, Bible, uh, it may even mean sexual pleasure. Uh, when uh, Sarah's 90 years old, she uh, says, will a woman who is 90 years old have this Edana? And you can hear the word Eden uh, there, and uh, it's translated in the ESV, will a woman... 90 years old had this pleasure. Um, it could be talking of the pleasure of ha finally having a son. Uh, it could be talking about the sexual pleasure of conceiving a son. If that's true, you contrast Eden, which is nothing but pleasure, uh, fellowship with God, 
uh, one command, procreate until you filled the whole world with babies, versus uh, God insisting on a sign that will hurt a man um, connected with procreation, the most pain a man will ever feel uh, in his life. Why is that? Why is that contrast? I think the Bible would say this is how you're to start to uh, think of why God uh, did this and why he implemented uh, this painful, bloody rite. Uh, Colossians 2 says, In him, that is in Jesus, in him you were circumcised. So this is all believers, male uh, and female. Uh, in Christ, you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. What the Jesus event accomplished was a spiritual circumcision for all believers. And that circumcision was a putting off of the body of flesh, a putting off of the thing that made you spiritually dirty before God by the circumcision of Christ. This is connecting Christ's death on the cross with a spiritual circumcision that every single Christian needs. Uh, at the core of who we are in Adam is a polluted, dead heart, um, a thing that makes us think wrongly before God, uh, a corruption that because we procreate uh, with our unredeemed bodies, we produce after our own kind, and that means that Everything that is conceived normally is conceived spiritually dead and therefore um, flawed before God. But the scripture is saying that Christ fixed that. Christ enduring the ultimate painful, the ultimate bloody rite of crucifixion on the cross, that that was Christ cutting away the thing that caused us to be spiritually filthy before God. So when we think of circumcision, God is saying, think about what Christ did. Christ is the key to understanding uh, what this is about in Scripture. And here's the promise. Um, the book of Deuteronomy is uh, Moses' last sermon. Um, if he preached it all at the same time, it was about five hours long. Um, God had told him, uh, go speak to the people, and when you're finished preaching the sermon, I'm going to kill you. That's what God told him. And I don't know if Moses was stringing that out. I don't think uh, that's true, but it's very odd. God says, I'm going to kill you, and and Mo Moses preaches this five-hour sermon that basically says, get your life in order. Uh, get your act straight. Um, these are God's law. You need to follow it. But at the very end of that sermon, Moses admits you're not going to be able to do it. Um, you, you, you're stubborn. Uh, you resist God, you resist uh, God's leading, but then at the very end of this sermon, right before, this is minutes away from Moses dying, this is what he says, and the Lord your God will circumcise your heart. So he's uh, had people go through this ceremony, men, Adult men have gone through it, the most pain they would ever feel. Uh, children have gone through it. Uh, at the end, Moses says, this is what it's about. One day, God will circumcise your heart. 
there's a dirtiness in your heart, there's a, a bent in your heart that's uh, uh, pointing toward what's wrong, but here's the thing, God's going to cut that dirtiness away. God is going to circumcise your heart. God is going to circumcise the heart of your offspring. And the result of that circumcision is so that you will love the Lord your God. God is going to circumcise, and the result is that this most lovable entity in the universe, that your heart's going to function rightly, and you're going to recognize that God is the most lovable entity in the universe, and your heart's going to work. God's going to cut something away, and the result is you'll love God, and you'll love God not with a little bit. You'll love God with all your heart. And you'll love God with all your soul. And the result of that is you are really going to live when that happens. Moses is about to die. He's warned people. He's promised people. He's begged. He's pleaded. But at the end of his sermon, he says, this is what's going to happen. God is going to circumcise your heart. And why do we need a new heart? Why do we need God to cut something away for us to be right? Well, because David's words of himself are true of us too. I was brought forth in iniquity. In sin did my mother conceive me. Now, David is the eighth son of his father and mother. Uh, David is not saying that uh, the act uh, that his mother performed was somehow sin. Rather, he's saying the moment I was conceived in the womb, I was in sin. Uh, Psalm 51 is his confession after sin with Bathsheba and then his murder of her husband Uriah to cover it up. And David is saying... Why did I do this? And he admits, I did it because from the moment I was conceived as a child, I was a sinner. The moment I was conceived, I had a heart that was plagued with evil. And David uh, says, create in me a clean heart, O oh God. If, if I'm going to walk in your ways, you're going to have to put a new heart in me you're going to have to cut away my old heart and you're going to have to give me a new heart. And so he admits, I was brought forth in iniquity. The, nobody taught me how to sin. I was a sinner from conception. Uh, Ephesians uh, 2, 1 and 2 says, And you were dead in your trespasses and in the sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now work at work in the sons of disobedience. Uh, we were dead. We were all dead. We all have this thing at the core of who we are the moment we're conceived that's just wrong, uh, that doesn't follow God's law, that doesn't love God, that doesn't love other people. And God is saying he's coming up with a way to fix that. Now Paul's going to help us with what circumcision means in the Old Testament. And this is going to help us with why God almost killed Moses uh, for not obeying the law. Paul says this, for circumcision indeed is of value if, if you obey the law. But if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. If you're a Jewish person, and you, if you're a man and have undergone circumcision, then God counts you as part of his people. And you're in. You're in the Mosaic Covenant. 
you're following the law. But Paul says the moment you break the law, that circumcision becomes uncircumcision. You are no longer uh, at peace with God. Your circumcision is of no value. Paul says, so if a man who is uncircumcised but keeps the precepts of the law, and uh, where he's getting this is Ezekiel uh, 36, God writing the law in someone's heart. If a man who is uncircumcised keeps the precept, precepts of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? Then he who is physically uncircumcised but keeps the law will condemn you who have the written code and circumcision but break the law. For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical, but a Jew, and Paul's talking about a real Jew here, is one who is one inwardly. And circumcision is a matter of the heart. Circumcision happens by the Spirit. It is not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. Now, if you take that and you ask, uh, well, who is the only truly obedient Jewish person? There's only one answer. Jesus is the only one who was ever circumcised and followed the law. Therefore, Jesus is the one perfect Jew. Paul's argument is people who are engrafted in Jesus share his circumcision and share his perfection before God. And since Jesus is a new Adam, he's passing on to all his supernatural offspring that new heart that loves God and is truly obedient. So circumcision, Paul is saying, is never about the painful, bloody, uh, physical act. It was always pointing beyond itself to a greater spiritual truth. Why is it bloody and painful? Why is it male only? It's all those things because it was pointing to Jesus and what he was going to do to circumcise us spiritually on the cross. And that's what Colossians says, having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. Uh, until your connection with Jesus, you still have that dirtiness of soul. Uh, you can cover it up. You can uh, maybe get really good at not showing that uh, pollution of soul to other people, but uh, the Bible it says it's still there, and it will always be there until a person connects with Jesus because it's the death of Jesus that cuts away that filthiness and enables uh, the new heart from God. We were buried with him in baptism, and we were raised with him uh, as believers. And you were dead in your trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh. God made alive together with him, having f forgiven us all our trespasses. Uh, I've said before in a class like this, I may have said it in this class, uh, can you imagine being in uh, Mercedes-Benz Stadium at a Christian uh, venue and uh, they have the praise songs playing and, and the big uh, screen uh, uh, projection TVs and you're watching all these things and all of a sudden you realize a YouTube clip comes up and, and you're looking at it and, and about a second later you realize it's a YouTube clip of your life and you realize that it's kind of the low lights of all your failures in life. 
if you're like me and you're sitting in the middle of the floor looking at that, you would get up from your seat and you would run toward the exit hoping that you could get to the door before the clip starts showing uh, the reality of your uh, sin. That, that's how most people uh, would be if, if that clip came up because we're pretty good at hiding things, but we can't change our own hearts. And that pollution is there, and that sin is there. And if you want, if you uh, want to try to buy into the lie of our culture that says, I don't need God to be good, start thinking of the things that could be on that YouTube clip. The things in your life, if someone had access to uh, the thoughts of your heart, to uh, the things that you've actually done, the things that you've actually talked about imagine that just plastered up would you be willing to say i don't need god to be good or would you say with paul a wretched man that i am who will deliver me from this body of death who will cut away this filthiness that's polluting my soul paul is saying in the circumcision of jesus you have been forgiven all your trespasses all those have been canceled, canceled out the record of debt that stood against us with all its legal demand. He set this aside, nailing it to the cross. That's why I love that picture that we started with on the PowerPoint of Jesus on the cross and the uh, serpent dragon uh, wounding Jesus' feet, but in that process, Jesus is crushing uh, the serpent's uh, uh, head in the circumcision of Jesus he has disarmed rulers and authorities when God cuts away that pollution of soul at the core of who you are uh, Satan has no more authority uh, over you you do not belong to his kingdom anymore he is not your ruler so when we think of circumcision is a sign in the Old Testament we have a physical sign a painful bloody male only sign but that's never what it was about what it always was about was circumcision of the heart God coming up with a way to cut that uh, putrid uh, malignant uh, gross evil mass away from the core of who you were. Uh, and he did it through the suffering, the pain and suffering of Jesus. So how does Jesus make this narrative make sense? Well, uh, Jesus went through uh, ultimate pain. Um, circumcision uh, is a temporary pain. It's the most pain an adult man will ever feel, but it's temporary and it only lasts uh, a while, maybe um, the recovery pain a month, um, Jesus went through ultimate pain to cut away this pollution of soul that plagues all of us. And Jesus was a man, and that's why uh, God made it a male-only uh, right. Uh, when circumcision was happening as the uh, initiating right, all of that is looking forward to the person of Jesus. Now the initiating rite is baptism, and it's a painless, bloodless rite that's applied to men and women, and that's the case because it's looking back to the provision that Jesus had, has made. This is an elegant meta-narrative drama uh, designed by God, but it all makes sense when you start asking the question, how is it related to Jesus? This is where uh, circumcision is implemented for the first time in Genesis 17. God says to Abraham, this is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it will be a sign 
of the covenant between me and you. In other words, uh, it's going to be a physical thing that points beyond itself to a greater spiritual truth. Um, it's a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you will be circumcised. Every male throughout your generations, whether born in your house or bought with your money from any foreigner who is not of your offspring. Well, this is a, a strange thing. Uh, why is it the eighth day? Well, what else happens on the eighth day in the Bible? The first day of new creation. Uh, if God said, let there be light on day one, did God do anything on the eighth day? Well, yeah, some pretty cool things happened on the eighth day. Jesus rose from the dead on the first day of the second week, uh, the first day of new creation. Um, the law was given on the eighth day, that is the day after the Sabbath following Passover, 50 days later, it was given on a Sunday. The Holy Spirit was given on a Sunday, 50 days after that. And we're going to see that in scripture, if we ever talked about how in uh, cultures before there was a number system that cultures used their alphabet uh, as their number system, have we ever talked about that in here? Uh, so if you do that, you know, you've got an alphabet, alpha, beta, gamma, um, delta, uh, epsilon, uh, zeta, those just become your numbers, one, two, three, four, et cetera. Do you know that the word Jesus has a gematria associated with it? Like if you just come to that and plug the numbers in, do you know that Jesus has a, a number? And did you know that it's the number 888? That's kind of interesting to me because like man's number is 666 and like man is created on the sixth day, Jesus died on the cross on the sixth day, the number of the beast is 666. It's interesting to me that somehow Jesus is connected with this number eight, uh, massively connected with it. And I wonder if this circumcision pointing forward isn't pointing forward ultimately uh, to Jesus, even, even in the numbers. God says, both he is born in your house, he is bought with your money, shall surely be circumcised, so shall my covenant be in your flesh, an everlasting covenant. Uh, that's the one thing about circumcision. Once you're circumcised, you can't change your mind. It's, that sign is yours forever right? Uh, there's no way to hide uh, that sign. It's an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. And then the text says this. Now realize that Abraham is almost a hundred years old when this happens. When he had finished talking with him, God went up from Abraham. Then Abraham took Ishmael his son and all those born in his house or bought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's house, and he circumcised the flesh of their foreskins that very day as God had commanded him. Abraham was 99 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. So here's my question. How difficult would it be for a man who is 100 years old to be circumcised? Uh, how painful uh, would that be? How could God ask Abraham to do that? 
Why is it a male-only sign? Well, uh, can you see that these things are pointing uh, beyond themselves? They're a sign. They point to something else. Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, just as God had commanded. Now, how bad was circumcision? Like, how bad was the pain of circumcision? Well, this is the English translation. When circumcising the whole nation was finished, they remained in their places in the camp until they were healed. Okay, you can translate it that way if you want to. This is what it says in Hebrew. You tell me if it's a little more vivid to you or not. When the circumcising of the whole nation was finished, uh, they remained in their places until, and here's a word. Okay, I remember the first time I read this in Hebrew, I, I just laughed, I couldn't believe it. This is from the word haya, and it means to come alive, okay? <laughs> so if you are literally translating it, it would say this, and it came about when uh, the circumcision of the whole nation was finished, they remained in the camp until they came alive again. Okay, how bad was it? Well, pretty much we were dead. How long were you? We were dead for, like, just kill me now. Don't talk to me. Don't, oh my goodness. Don't even. When they came back alive, okay, they're circumcised. When they came back alive, then they started doing things. It was like they were dead. They were so, uh, uh, it was so painful. In another account, uh, uh, Levi and Simeon talk a whole town into being circumcised. Uh, uh, Shechem had raped Dinah, and they were looking for a way to kill all the men, and so they talk them into being circumcised, and, and they all get circumcised thinking that they're going to intermarry, and uh, Shechem thinks he's going to get to marry uh, Dinah after he's raped her. And then when they're laying around in their uh, pain, two men kill a whole city. How bad was the recovery pain? If a whole city can't defend themselves from two men, that tells you that this is, this is very, very, very bad. Um, I'm going to show you half a slide uh, here for this next slide, and it's the top half of an Egyptian hieroglyphic that the bottom half is uh, a slave circumcising a person. So we're going, to, we're going to look at the top half of this slide, and the bottom half uh, I've left off, but th this is hieroglyphic in uh, a pyramid that shows two men being circumcised. How painful was it? Well, notice this guy is being held down while he's being circumcised. This was horrific pain. What's this talking about? This is talking about the horrific pain that Jesus went through when he died on the cross to kill that thing inside of us that's polluted. It was never about the physical sign. It was always about the spiritual, about the thing signified. It's called a sign. Signs point beyond themselves to a greater spiritual truth. This is why some people will baptize children, and some people won't. The people who baptize children say, okay, well, if this was applied to children, then we need to apply baptism to our children. 
And you can see the logic of that. And others say, no, I want uh, my child to uh, experience conversion, and I want them to go undergo the initiating rite uh, as a believer. And you can see the logic of that. It isn't that either one of those positions is like, uh, you know, Christian or non-Christian. It's just two approaches. It's coming to this idea that circumcision is a sign, is the initiating rite, and how do we experience that? I appreciate it, uh, those churches I've gone to that have been generous in spirit. Uh, I think the Evangelical uh, Free Church will allow you to do either one of uh, those. If you want your child uh, baptiz baptized, they'll uh, give uh, your child uh, covenant baptism. And if you believe in believer's baptism, they're not going to pressure you. There's something about that that uh, I like, a generosity of spirit in interpretation. That's helpful when we realize that both baptism and circumcision is really about something that God is doing for us spiritually. Now, I don't know about you, but I think it would be impossible to physically circumcise yourself. Um, I think it's too painful to circumcise yourself. Um, if you've ever experienced great pain uh, in your life, uh, great physical pain, you know how incapacitating uh, that can be. Uh, you, you can... Uh, perhaps have sympathy with the picture of the man who's being held down uh, while he's being circumcised. It's impossible to physically circumcise yourself. So what do we do with passages where Moses says to Israel, circumcise the foreskin of your heart? Because there are two ways you could take that. One way is that you can do it and that Moses is saying um, for you to try or you to do it. The second way is a realization that you can't do it and Moses wants you to try and realize you can't. Um, I've had the pleasure of having, uh, helping raise five uh, children and uh, I'm very uh, close, love my children, but they all have different ways they learn. And one of my sons, whom I'm closest to uh, right now, he learns by doing. And uh, when he was learning how to drive a car, I, I had this uh, uh, kind of fast German car, and uh, I remember I let him borrow it for um, uh, his prom, and he came back and told me later, he said, you know, uh, when your car gets up to 95, you don't even feel it. I thought, you had my car up to 95 on your prom date? But he learns by doing. When he was uh, getting his uh, license, uh, he was driving my car. I'd let him drive it a lot uh, when he was 15, and we were going to the uh, driver's uh, license bureau, and he was driving like a madman. And uh, I said, uh, son, you, you need to slow down. Oh, you're just, you just, don't tell me what to do. And I could have been this hard nose and said, well, I'm just not going to take you to take your license. But I thought, okay, I'm going to let you, I'm going to let you do it your way. And so he got there and he took his license test and he failed it because he's driving too fast. And he came out and he was 
crying his eyes out. He he was had been all excited about coming home with his license, and and he failed. But that's how my son learns, and once he learns a lesson, he lear- he's got it for life. What if God is doing that with us here? Saying, okay, you, you want to be a good person? Circumcise your heart. Just cut out that thing that's dirty inside of you. Conquer your own sin. And we try, and I don't know about you, but I, I've never been skilled enough to circumcise my own heart. I need God to circumcise my heart. Maybe God's helping us learn that. God promises that the Lord your God, he will cut away that dirty thing inside of you. And he will cut away the dirty thing in your offspring and you will love. And the result is you will truly live. What is circumcision about? Physical circumcision is like Mount Sinai. It's death, it's pain, it's blood, it's difficult. God's circumcision is to get us where we can live in the Garden of Eden. Um, I see that my time's almost up might ask the question, why did God almost kill Moses for not uh, circumcising? If my thesis is right that Jesus is the answer to all these problems, was Moses perfectly obedient? Was he perfectly obedient? No. Because to be God's true deliverer, you have to be perfectly obedient. God was helping Moses realize that uh, by showing him that even partial obedience is disobedience if you're being judged on God's scale of perfection. All right, I see that my time is up. I'll see you on Friday.